Hi, this is Miles Marie, the Soldier of Mary. So I'm answering your questions on the contents of this book. The uh, ultimate, the end times are already here. The end times are already with us. Um, which is uh, the interview with Jacinta Gonzalez, the uh, visionary of Garabandal, who broke her silence and had a had a few days of interviews with the author Jose Maria Zabala. Um, he, came, he went over to her house in the U.S. and recorded or, or, or did some interviews with her, and this book was the result of those interviews. So a few days ago, I asked people if they could give me some questions, maybe things that I uh, should um, try and uh, go through the book and then tell you what uh, Hathenta said about these particular topics, because you will have already seen my video where I review the book, but the book is... 250 pages long so I couldn't cover I had to choose certain little topics and so I asked people what they'd like me to answer on so in this video I'm going to answer questions on the following topics Pope Benedict, Pope Francis, Vatican II, Communion in the Hand, Franco, Elvis, the chastisement, Covid, Communism, New World Order and the Milagruco. Let's start with the last one Milagruco. that was the uh, the alleged miracle that happened to Conchita in Garabandal when the visible form of the host appeared on upon her tongue and was recorded on film. The um, Milagruco, it isn't mentioned in the book. Uh, Hathinta talks a lot about Holy Communion and the reverence for Holy Communion, but Milagruco, I guess the interviewer didn't ask about it. The interviewer didn't ask about that one. So now let's go back to the beginning and begin with Pope Benedict. It's clear that Hathinta is really keen on Pope Benedict. He's one of her uh, heroes. She talks about him twice in the book in two rather extended periods. Uh, the first section, beginning on page 112, she said, Pope Benedict XVI always said, always spoke the truth. And um, the interviewer understands already that she has a great admiration and respect and love for Pope Emeritus Benedict. And uh, he asks her, is that a mistake? And she says, no, that's that's not a mistake at all. That's very true. I've always loved him. I've always loved him in a, in a very special way. And he asks her, what is it you like so much about him? And she says, it basically, before anything else, it was he always spoke the truth without caring who he was in front of and whether they were going to like what he was going to say. Um, like our Lord, that's what the interviewer says. And she says, yeah, that's right. And so he asks her whether he... She ever met Pope Benedict, and she says, "Yeah, I met him when he was Cardinal Ratzinger. I had a meeting with, I had a meeting with him. I think she says, and he gave me her blessing. And she, he asked, she, he, she has asked, did Benedict believe in the apparitions of Garabandal? And she says, I don't know that. I don't have no, I don't know about that. Um, we didn't have an opportunity uh, to talk about that. Um, and." Um, and what she does know is that he didn't like the message that Conchita received in 1965. You know, the one many cardinals, bishops, priests are on the way to hell, taking many souls with them. He didn't like that. She does know that, but Pope Benedict did not like that one. And that, that um, yeah, it didn't, they didn't like that one. Uh, maybe it was the fact that it said the cardinals and the bishops' parts and that uh, it would have been enough for our lady just to have said priests. But anyway, at one point she, she says that, and then later on in the book, talking about Pope Benedict, uh, page 199, she talks about him again, and she says, um, did it, this is about the renunciation of Pope Benedict XVI. This is more interesting, maybe. Uh, she's asked, did it surprise you that Pope Benedict resigned or renounced the throne, renounced the papacy? And she said, yeah, it did. It did, in, in truth. And uh, she says, I know that he had some health problems in 2013, but, you know, he's, he's gone a long time now, and he's, <laughs> he's, he's lived quite a lot afterwards. And uh, she says, I really loved him, and um, I, hope he has a, I hope he's well, and I keep praying for him. And she says that... Um, she says that... We don't know exactly what happened with Pope Benedict XVI's um, resignation you know she he, she says it surprised her and that uh, she used to think she always thought popes were popes for the whole of their life um, but she adds they attacked him a lot 
and um, she kind of thinks that um, maybe Pope Benedict, if he hadn't resigned, he would have been got out of the way by other means because he was saying things that people didn't like and that the devil is very mixed up, very involved in the Vatican. So that's what she says. Um, so she kind of thinks that Benedict XVI was a really good man and a holy man and that that um, if he hadn't resigned then he would have been gotten rid of because people uh, they didn't like him so that's quite interesting that she says that uh, moving on to the next one about Pope Francis in the same section she kind of moves on the interview moves on to talk about John Paul II and Pope Francis she also liked John Paul II let me put that in there as well and the um, the interviewer asks about a lot of the evils that are going on in the church today. He says stuff like, you know, there's some countries where it seems like, like um, divorced and remarriage. Those who are living, people that are in second marriages where they are committing sins together are receiving Holy Communions. And she's, she completely is rightfully opposed to that. She says that's completely against the teaching of the Eucharist. And she says that that would not be taking place if John Paul II was still Pope. He would not be staying there with, he wouldn't be sitting there with his arms crossed. Uh, that's what she says about the current situation with, um, with people receiving Holy Communion that shouldn't be receiving Holy Communion and the attack on the family and that kind of thing. Um, and she says that people should convert it, with the church should be open to receiving sinners but it should call them to conversion and repentance before they can receive our lord in holy communion um then about pope francis it says uh he asks uh, what do you think about people that are criticizing uh, pope francis today and she says you know at the end of the day he is the pope in the earlier section you kind of think is she saying that pope benedict is still the pope because she says he's always she says for me he's always going to be pope that's that's how she says it at one point but so you're a bit confused at that point is she going down some route of pope francis isn't the pope but then he asks her and she says no he is the pope and he has uh, as she puts it a very distinct talent from his predecessors um his way is very different from his predecessors john paul ii and benedict but he is the pope and we must respect him and we must never forget that our Lord gave Peter the uh, authority. Everything that will be bound on earth will be bound in heaven. Everything that you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. But then she has, but also it's very certain that today there is much confusion. It's a very difficult situation. Very difficult. And the interviewer says, we must pray a lot for him, right? And she says, he is the Pope, the actual Pope. And as such, we must respect him while he does not change the commandments nor the doctrine of the church we must respect him so it's interesting there that little bit there that we we don't have to respect him if he doesn't do those things um if he denies those things but that's what all catholics believe because catholics believe that the pope's authority is one of preserving uh, the teaching entrusted to him by christ the successor of, of saint peter and to the extent the pope teaches something that's ex that's against commandments or against the deposit of faith well he's not acting as a pope in the, in as much as he ever does that so she's got a really deep um a deep uh, understanding of of the role of the papacy not a, a superficial one but quite a deep theological one you know credit to her she's she's well formed uh, in her understanding of, of the role of the papacy um, next question about Vatican II. She doesn't mention the words Vatican II don't come up in the book. Um, someone in the in the questions asked about um, the uh, fact that Our Lady said that the council would be a success. Um, I've got another video on that one. Maybe you check that one out. Our Lady said some... We don't exactly know what Our Lady said about Vatican II. We know what the children tell us. We, we know what the children said out loud. We don't have Our Lady's words. So... Anyway, there's a few things we could possibly draw together about what Our Lady actually said to the children on Vatican II. Um, next one, communion in the hand. Yep, she talks about communion in the hand quite a bit. We all know from that prophetic vision or dream that Hathinta had that she was always taught by Almighty God that communion 
ought not to be received in the hand. And so she says that um, she talks about the dream that she had. And I've got a video on that one. Check out the video if you want to learn about the prophetic dream that Hathinda had about the coming into existence of communion in the hand. Because she woke up one. She told her mom one day, I've had this dream about communion in the hand. And her mom replied, that will never happen. That's never going to happen, Hathinda. And actually, another thing that's added here is the mom asked her, and did you take communion in the hand in the dream? And she says, no, of course I didn't, mum. Of course I didn't. Um, okay, on communion in the hand, she says, I recognize that the Pope has, commit, has permitted communion in the, ma in the hand. And we ought to respect that, although we should not share it. Although we don't share it, although we don't do it. Uh, we, we need to respect that, that, um, that it's allowed. And she says, I've got no doubt that um, communion always has to be in the, on, on, in the tongue, on the mouth, because my hands are not consecrated. That's how she sees it, that, that uh, your hands have to be consecrated to touch the Blessed Sacrament. But then he asks her, he says something about St. Thomas Aquinas and how St. Thomas Aquinas says, obviously a lay person has to pick up the Blessed Sacrament if someone is about to stamp on the Blessed Sacrament. And she says, yeah, you're right there, I know what you mean. The communion, the, the ability of a lay person to touch the Blessed Sacrament is obviously allowed in such exceptional circumstances. But um, the world today has made such an exceptional measure something that is daily. And um, that's something that she doesn't, to the point that communion kneeling down on the tongue, an act of adoration, to do that nowadays you're looked at you're looked at as like a weirdo if you do that and she says that is completely wrong it's not an act of pride it's the opposite because hell is filled is the only place that is filled where nobody is the only place filled of people who never kneel down it's the only place where nobody kneels down that's what hell's like that's how she describes it um and she says do you think that our lord agrees with communion in the hand and uh, she says, um, yeah, he doesn't like it. Um, our Lord does not, uh, is not in agreement with it. That, that sounds reasonable to her, that our Lord is not in agreement with communion in the hand. Um, she says, I saw that he does not want communion received in the hand. After the dream, when I was 15 years old, um, she, knew it, she knew it was wrong. And so she has never done it herself. Um, and um, it undermines the real presence. It undermines the truth that our Lord is present there, body, blood, soul, and divinity. But at the same time, she says that, that the fact is the church has allowed it, so it's really difficult for priests. And they, um, they aren't in a position, in the new mass it seems, light went out, they aren't in a position to refuse people coming in the hands and that kind of does seem to be the case at least in the new mass so she says it's a difficult situation uh, but she clearly continues receiving on the tongue and she thinks it's something that our lord is opposed to communion in the hand next one um franco franco who was the uh, ruler of of spain the um the general in charge of spain for a number of years after the uh, Spanish Civil War. So she doesn't say that much about him. He adds that um, they agree that he was a spiritual man, that he was a religious man. They wonder about why he chose Juan Carlos to be the first king of Spain after the um, dissolution of Franco's uh, dictatorship. They both think that it was a kind of weird decision and that there was a better choice available, a much more pious individual that they think that uh, Franco should have chosen. But that given his old age um, and his weakening health before he died, um, he didn't change his earlier decision to have Juan Carlos as the first king of, of, the, of, of the new Spain. But they, um, they think that it was a bad choice. Juan Carlos was a very bad uh, king from a Catholic point of view. And that's, that's certainly true. Um, and what else did he say about Franco? Yeah, one of Franco's ministers of uh, his government visited Garabandal in the days of the apparitions. So it seems that quite likely uh, Franco knew about the apparitions of Garabandal, but she doesn't say anything more than that about, his, um, about him. Next one, about Elvis. 
Yes, she says a few things about Elvis, but she accepts that Elvis died. She accepts that Elvis died, and she says that he died not so much because of drugs or because of health, other help, uh, because of his weight um, or alcohol, or whatever substance abuse. She says that, and I think this must be known, must be well known by people that research Elvis, that he had a problem with uh, a genetic congenital uh, heart defect or something, and that something to do with chromosome eleven. And it meant that he was always destined, as it were, to die young of heart problems. Um, that's what she said. Um, and she talks about how um, Elvis's daughter, Lisa Marie Presley, she was cured as a baby by a, mirror, by a medal kissed by Our Lady of Garibandau. Um, that guy, Joey Lomangino, the Italian, he was person that knew Elvis, he knew Elvis, and Elvis's daughter, Lisa Marie, was really unwell, and and he gave Elvis the medal for the girl to kiss, and she kissed it, and she recovered, and Elvis seemed to think, and everyone seemed to think that it was miraculous that she had recovered from the, uh, the illness. Next thing, she talks a bit about Elvis singing um, a hymn in honor of Our Lady of Fatima, which he recorded in 1971 and how that that hymn or that song was um was uh, as a result of the conversion of his friend lee denson to catholicism what else about elvis that's about all he says about it she says about elvis she says that we need to pray for um we need to pray for his daughter that she has um health of soul as well as health of body they they agree that next one um Chastisement. What did she say about that chastisement? Um, especially in relation to, to COVID. Let's go in relation to COVID first. So in relation to COVID, uh, page 175, she talks a bit about that. Okay, he asks, um, the pandemic of coronavirus, is it perhaps a kind of plague, a biblical plague, plague like those that affected Egypt, uh, perhaps merited by humanity? And she says, her first response is, well, I don't know. I've seen many, many bad things. I've seen many bad things. It's really strange. Uh, when coronavirus broke broke in to our, our situation, I thought to myself, is the virus perhaps something that was allowed to escape into the world? You know, the idea that it was invented in China and, and deliberately put out. She said that to begin with. She thought that to herself because of the way it spread across the world so quickly and the dizzying effect it had on everything. But she says, um, but if God has permitted it, or God has obviously permitted it, it is for our good and not, and not to do us harm. That's her refrain about the virus. Her refrain on the virus is, if it is a chastisement from God, and God certainly has permitted it, it's not to do us harm, but to lead us closer to him. And she says it's obviously that's a hard thing to recognize from a human point of view, because so many innocent people have died because of the virus. It's a real nightmare. But she says that she hasn't lost hope because God will bring good out of the virus. And um, we don't realize that because we're nothing. And then she says, he asked her about how did you go through the virus, the pandemic? And she says, I was really scared. I spent three months without leaving my house. I had to watch mouse on television like everyone else. Um, and she says um, that she thinks that it brought, it brought her closer to God. She depended on God even more in the time of the height of the pandemic. And she says that maybe this pandemic will allow people to realize the importance of living in the state of grace, not striving for more material things. The fact that life is precarious, um, that having him is the most important thing in life. Having him at the center of our lives is the most important thing. That science is not, you know, science has not got all the answers. And she thinks that there will be conversions as a result of the pandemic. So, you know, an interesting point of view on the pandemic. God brings good out of it. What else? Uh, related to, so she doesn't see it as the chastisement of Garabandau. Um, not at all. She doesn't see that, as Mary Cruth had, Mary Cruth had, had suggested. Um, she adds on the subject of the chastisement. It's one interesting thing she says 
is you know that night of the screams business when uh, we're told that that was a vision of the um, chastisement well one thing that's interesting is that the crowd heard them saying oh the poor children the poor children or babies the poor babies and she suggests that probably it's because they were seeing a future vision of the horrific evil of abortion and she does talk about that quite a bit about how abortion is a great great evil on the world today and that she saw the chastisement as abortion is in some way linked up to the chastisement god permitting abortion is that a chastisement on us i don't know it's, it's really hard to work that one out abortion being abortion is a chastisement on humanity god has permitted abortion and i don't know it's um it's interesting but then there's also effects on adults the child chastisement would have and she says that she's not going to she's not going to describe what those effects are going to be she can't uh, really tell us what those are um, but the present situation is not the chastisement the subject of communism taking over the world she does talk about communism again she doesn't doesn't directly link this to the chastisement of Garaban now again she says the chastisement of Garaban now is conditional it can be avoided if we respond as a result of the miracle and the warning and um just um communism yes she says that it was mary lowley who received um, messages about the spreading of communism throughout the world so she says she doesn't have anything to say about that herself but on page 237 she tells us a little about about how mary lowley had this vision of communism spreading throughout the world and she says relating to the pandemic she says here um, yeah when the pandemic started then then uh, she thought back to Mary Lowley's words on communism because Mary Lowley had said that one of the signs of communism was the churches would close and she said at the beginning of the just at the beginning of the pandemic she kind of thought a little bit about is is communism spreading and she thinks to herself yeah communism does spread is spreading more a little and little it's spreading day by day throughout the world and then she describes um communism snatches away liberty from people in all senses and we've got to fight against it because liberties are being undermined are being taken away and before, before you realize it, it's too late. The demon is very sneaky and that he disguises himself in things that appear good. And because if he didn't do that, you'd, no one would be deceived by him. Um, so that's what she says. So she does kind of relate. The thing that bugs me a tiny bit about that is that she grew up in Catholic Spain. And there were very few liberties. There were a lot of restrictions in Catholic Spain on your daily life. And, you know, the society was fairly closed. There were a lot of restrictions on the press, on media. So the idea that, that taking away liberty equals communism, I don't think that adds up. Because our Catholic view of freedom is that freedom is about being able to do God's will and freedom for excellence. The just about having being able to do whatever you like, whenever you like, that isn't a Catholic vision of of what f true freedom is. Like sinning, for example, we see as Catholics as contrary to freedom. So anyway, but she does she does think that um, that communism is growing throughout the world, and that that um, that was something Mary Lowley said would happen and it is happening but she doesn't say that's chastisement or warning or anything like that she just says it seems like maybe mary lowley what mary lowley said it's coming to pass um i think that's kind of everything that people ask me about in the question section so so it's an it's got an interesting book it's got loads of um things to do with the apparitions that that you might not know already and we learn about Hathinta herself. We learn about some unusual things that the author asks her about. Much of it's available online already. Much of the Garabandala anecdotes are online already. Maybe something more uh, to finish with, something um, objectively a little more critical of something that she says in the book. No one asks this in the comments box, 
box. So I'm just going to throw this one in. And this is about, about her religious vocation. Why she didn't become a nun. Because, you know, that's what often people do ask. If they saw Our Lady, why didn't they enter into convents? And like, like with this, you know, apparition that had happened, this alleged apparition in uh, Medjugorje, where Our Lady's alleged to have said, oh yeah, I'm leaving it up to you guys, you get to decide on this one. I'm not going to tell you what you should do. Hathinta takes that line as well, that Our Lady gave her the freedom to choose whether she would enter religious life or not. To me, that I'm not so wild about that one, um, especially because if you have the freedom to choose, then you should choose the better option. You should choose a better option because you know that it's a better option. But I think maybe this is somewhere that Athinta needs more formation. I'd said earlier that her theology was really good, but there's one area and that's here of, of vocation and of the nobility of religious life. She has a very high view of the priesthood. At one point, she um, says that Our Lady told her that thing about, I think it's attributed to St. Francis, that he would kneel before a priest before an angel um, because of the priest's nobility and bearing the person of, of Christ and that kind of thing. She says that Our Lady told that to her, which is interesting. So, um, yeah, why not? So, but when it comes to religious life, she doesn't have such a noble point of view. I want to find the section about about this uh, thing to do with religious life because she says that she goes to the convent. She goes to visit the convent because she kind of thinks that maybe she should enter the convent after having seen Our Lady and everything. She's only 17 at the time, but you know the apparitions happened when she was um, 12, 13, 14, that era. So two years have passed or three years have passed since then and remember she's praying the rosary every day she's going to mass every day she's having loads of religious conversations with loads of people so she should have been fairly religiously astute lots of religious priests she has a spiritual director during that whole time or a lot of that time and so she goes to the convent um, and in order to try her vocation and when she gets there she says that it was a kind of, you know, wasn't a very nice looking building. It was a bit of a dark kind of uh, building. And she um, didn't like the appearance of the place. Her dad wasn't wild about her going to the convent. Her dad thought that she was still too young and that she should go to the, um, that she should, you know, grow up a little bit before she makes that kind of choice. But... She decides that, um, let me pause the tape while I find the thing. So they arrived at the, the cloister and they spoke with the sisters through the grill and the dad didn't want her to go in, but she did spend a bit of time there and she asked them through the grill, are you always here without going out of the cell? And one of them replied back to her, smiling, when when you love that is not important and then apparently she said oh do you have children i mean that's a weird thing for her to say she's 17 at that point she should know that nuns don't have children it's weird um and then she says that um um yeah so she worked she resolved she worked out for herself that she didn't have a vocation that's what she worked out, she says. But I stayed there a little time with them before abandoning it. I remember that I was crying every day because I wanted to go back to the town, go back to my town, back to the village. She was 17. I found that a bit weird. She used to write, she was writing to her parents, telling them that she wasn't happy, but the mother superior wrote the letters, ripped up the letters and said, you have to tell them that you are happy. And I said to them, I said to her back, but how am I going to say that if it's not the truth? And she insisted again and again that to be a monk, to be a sister, a nun, was the greatest thing that one could aspire to do in life. And that marriage is in the is inferior, is something inferior to, to being a, a, a nun. And then I looked, then she says, and then I looked fixed at her eyes and I said, well, 
I don't think my mum is less than you. I thought that was a bit... I thought that wasn't quite... And that's it. And then that's the, um, the end of that little anecdote about um, a time in the, in the convent. You know, later on she talks about how our Lord is, is the love of her life and she spends all her time thinking about him and loves him and that he's the most important thing. Maybe it would have been really beautiful if she could have added a little thing there saying, I said that when I was a girl, when I was 17, and I was beginning to be a bit unsure about the apparitions then. But now looking back, I can see that those nuns were right. You know, anyway, may Almighty God bless you, may Our Lady intercede for you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.